Welcome to Tigers Untapped, a Bluff City Media podcast. Stepping up to the microphone are your hosts, Trey Lasley and TJ Willis. Now, let's get to the show. What is up? Welcome to episode 92, TJ. We're two months away from uh, the century mark. Oh, yeah. I didn't he's think not that. working in the back. I had to click the banner on for us. Taking it's a tiger snooze. Slumming. Uh, Timothy, things are about to get real weird tonight. Uh, every couple of weeks on a Monday, TJ brings me in a six pack to work, which feels illegal. I put these in the fridge at FedEx, had to hide them way in the back. One of the beers this evening that TJ handed me earlier, the one we're going to drink this evening, Slow and Low. Is that what that says, TJ? Yeah, that's Slow and Low. Uh, Hamplines own Slow and Low. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a pineapple. <laughs> Get this. The second half is going to catch you off. Jalapeno Pilsner. It could get real freaky in here. Stores. And I think that's because it might get real freaky down in Tallahassee later this week. Let me be honest with you. This could be spicy. This is a the first test taste for me. And I, I don't know how I'm going to feel about this, but this isn't anything I would ever pick out of a lineup. But uh, when you do a beer <laughs> week is- for several years, and they don't can every beer that they that different breweries make. You kind of get limited at times. And Have you had this had before? A, no, I've never had this, and I've never had the. What was For that those of you that are just weeks listening ago? at home and you can't see me, I've been taking whiffs of this before I sip it. Oh, there's pineapple in there, but then there's like a subtle hint of bo right after it. And I think that's the jalapeno. Jalapeno poppers for the boys. Here we go. Look, we've gone from blueberry beer a couple oh. weeks ago to pineapple. No, 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 no. What are you no, going to do? No, no, no. <laughs> Who made this? This is so bad. What is this? This isn't a real beer. <laughs> I'll let you know I would not advise anyone to do this. What have you done? Uh. I'm going not, again. I mean, I'm not going to ruin the review, but. <laughs> I, don't, I don't understand. I, I don't understand it. Oh, gosh. Hopefully the game this weekend is much better than this is going. Oh, wow. I, uh, I don't know <laughs> that I can do <laughs> We may have to pull an audible. I might have to call Natalie to get me another one to come up here. No, you gotta you gotta follow through. Oh, it's very light in color though. <laughs> this I is feel it in my chest. strange. Goodness, I wish Kenny could try this. It tastes a little bit like a fart. Like you know, like a Ugh. all right. Holy oh, Toledo. Yeah. TJ, that is bad. I don't know what possessed you to even pick that. Whoa. Well, that's what I was saying. Like, we do. I mean, this is episode what? 100? Or no, 92? 92 plus we did what? I don't know. 18 or 20. The other yeah, place. You just run out of beer. And at some point, you just have to branch out and do something I'm, that you normally wouldn't I'm do. I'm surprised, honestly. We have Exhibit a. a. We've done a jalapeno beer, I thought. I thought we had two, but not pineapple and all. And that's. I don't, I don't know even what it the, is. Uh, it's not that it's spicy. There is a weird taste in there. Don't give it away, dude. We have a whole section about that. Let's get talking about oh, segment one. Goodness. Uh, Mind off this thing. Last week, big news broke. Big, 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 big news. Mm-hmm. Uh, Memphis has got a bit of a staph infection going around. TJ news broke four staff members infected with the fire bug. Laid, uh, laid off, not asked to come back. 
Look, I'll put it this way. Oh, why do I keep going back to it? I think it's just I ran a little while ago, so I want a beer, and I just keep forgetting that this is not not good. this one, not this one. Oh goodness, what was it we had last week? OG Light. Can we go back to that? Ow. Uh, four staff members lost. I don't think, outside of Rick, I don't think they're huge losses. You're talking about Faraci being gone. Uh, Dyson being gone and uh, help me with a third. Dude, I can't focus right now. My it's burning my chest. I feel it. Denim pumps. It's not, it's not that it's that hot. It's just, it's so weird. This has thrown us so far off. Kenny, what? Give me the staff members again. I can't even think straight. It's a uh, Rosser. Give me yeah. Rosser. Yeah. I mean, mostly support role guys. Faraji. I don't know. If you guys listen to 92.9, Hitman went on the week before and basically threw all these guys under the bus and said that they were all horrible human beings and terrible at anything that they provided to this university and basketball team. I'm just kidding. He didn't say all that. But did say that they... Uh, they didn't need to be on the staff. What do you know? Less than a week later, they're all gone. Isn't that kind of uh, weird was, timing, though? Okay, so this is what I'm going to say. In the grand scheme of things, people are making a big deal about the turnover. I saw Penny's article, whatever, that he had with Ross Steen. He came out, mentioned turnover, and a lot of guys moving on to better jobs or better opportunities for them, which I totally get, right? Like, there's definitely been some guys that have left for better roles. Frank Hayes sure. went to Texas. Cody went to LSU, which is that better? LSU. I don't know. But now he's yeah, the head I'd coach say it's better. The, it's a higher pay. I need the head coach for the Go Go's now. Um, I think so. I think that's right. So I mean, definitely guys moving on for other opportunities. Um, and I don't, I don't think it's necessarily losing Faraji and Rosser and um, Dyson is like into the. If this has happened in April, I don't think it's that big of a deal at all. I think it's more so the timing of it now that we're what, like two months away from basketball. Exactly. Yeah. And you're making pretty significant staff changes. I mean, in yeah. terms of numbers of people leaving, right? Mm -hmm. The biggest one, I think, out of all of that is obviously Slick Rick's now gone. Sure. Which we kind of heard some rumors of um, his absence in the weeks leading up to that and maybe some differences between him and uh and, and coach hardaway going on but Shocker. surprising nonetheless we kind of heard that maybe things would be working out i think he was a, a very popular man amongst the boosters he kind of helped turn the nil around um but this close to the season i think that's what's concerning i don't know that feels like the wrong word to use because again i don't think 75% of the guys that were announced as leaving are really that big of a loss. I think it's just the timing yeah. when that's happening. Well, I mean, concerning in the sense that it's, again, like you said, two months away from the season, and you more or less have an entire staff to fill. Maybe not more or less. I mean, I guess there's two spots that we know one assistant's still there. You have Mike Davis on staff. What is his By the way, going forward? He is. I walked in with with Mike Davis into the Liberty Hole on Saturday. Really? We walked in. Yeah, we walked into Gate Two, the same time. Okay. Gate One. I don't know. Look at that. Gate Already two. there. So, um, he's here supporting it, the athletic program. You have Nolan Smith. They've announced the hiring of Nolan Smith. So you've put together these guys very quickly. You kind of, it's, for all intents and purposes, it seems like Penny had an idea of who he wanted to bring in if there were a change. If not, I mean, yeah, think these things happen very quickly. So to me, it kind of seems like he kind of knew um, who yeah, he was going to replace some folks with. Yeah, I don't, I don't think it came out of nowhere. I think there's been some things in the work for a while. Um, some alluded to maybe budget things. And, you know, we heard about Nolan initially back in like June or July. And still, yeah. I don't think still has te has he technically been announced officially by the university. I know that there's been I think so. Hitman and some others have said that he's here and is it's 
basically official, but I don't know if there's been an official statement by the staff mm -hmm. or the university that he's hired. But anyway, that's all to say some of these guys, I think, you know, you're trying to free up some budget for some of these other assistants to bring in things like that. Um, yeah. And I wonder, you know, the timing of it is also weird because of Quite. this letter of allegations that has shown up out of nowhere anonymously. What? What just happened? Could you hear that? Did that come I through? Heard something, but yeah, I don't know. YouTube TV switched the audio to my headphones, so I thought it was like pushing the mic as well. Mm, interesting. Um, this letter of allegations, supposedly it's been floating around for weeks. Um, nobody was really doing anything about it. And then the university of Memphis acknowledged it. I think Pat Forty put it out that we had acknowledged it with the sports illustrated. Um, no official allegations, notice of allegations has come from the NCAA. I think the university has just acknowledged, Hey, we received this. Um, and we're aware of the letter. Mm-hmm. In the letter, which I'm sure everybody, if you're listening to this, you're a big enough fan, you already know what's in there. But um, basically three things. What, a $30,000 payment for DeAndre to commit, a $60,000 payment for uh, ACOT two years ago to commit, and then uh, the academic scandal involving, what was it, Malco, Ashton, um, Quinterly and Jordan Brown, I think, were the names listed in there, um, which we were obviously already aware of. I mean, my concerns with that is why is why is ACOT getting double what DeAndre was paid? That is absurd. Should have used all wow. of that to get DeAndre. Uh, for what it's worth, allegedly. Yeah, that's that's all the money that we know of that's been reported. So. Just I would word it that way, you know. I mean, there's no saying there's there's no factual evidence. And I mean the fact that this was written anonymously, how are they even like yeah. there's not really much ground to stand on? I think there's certain people out there that have a, a good sense and feel for where they think that this has come from. Sure. Um but I don't I mean, I think the only thing that's concerning about it is you're on probation, but two of the alleged things that have happened that are violations happened before that time period. Um, the only one that's in there is this academic scandal, which I think the, the NCAA has already been looking into anyway. So um, I don't know if anything will come of it. It was very coincidental that yeah. these staff members were let go. And then this notice of, or this letter kind of leaks out. Um, but Ed Scott was on the radio. He was on uh, Jeff on Friday and, and said that had nothing. These were not related. He was made aware of the letter when he was interviewing and hired back in July, June area. Mm -hmm. But he hadn't seen the letter until, I guess, this week. Um, very impressive individual. It's weird to like somebody so much when you know that they're not being openly truthful about everything they say. Um, he said he had That's no, fair. these were all Penny's decisions, but it's hard to believe that he wouldn't have, with what's going on, a little bit of cleanup needs to happen around the basketball program and that he didn't have some sort of, Hey, uh, we need to make some changes around here and clean this image up given, given the probation and what's kind of been going on. Sure. You think Ed really had nothing to do with it? I mean, <clears throat> I think he probably threw out. I think it's a situation where Ed's going to let Penny run his program. He's going to let Ryan run his program. Like everyone's going to get to run their program, but he may make a suggestion or just be in conversation with Penny about, hey, this may have come across my desk. Do you want to talk about it? And Penny's like, yeah, let's talk about it. Uh, we can cut some dead weight here in the first place. Because, like you said, I mean, it's not like, um, we're not there. We're not at practice every day. We don't know what assistant is doing what. But when you think about the people that were cut, like what other than Rick, Rick aside, I think there were just some some differences in how the program was going to be ran. And that's going to happen when you have a, a former head coach you know, butting heads with a current head coach. They do things differently. I think you're naturally going to have that. Um, 
but with the other guys, what do they do on a day to day basis? Are they truly providing you any benefit? Like, what does Faraji do? Is he really going to help you land up Memphis talent? And that, I mean, is that his one big thing? He's, I think, defense and he coached in the city of Memphis. You don't think yeah. any already kind of gives you that, right? So it seems, well, Andrew, I think we talked about this previously. It felt like with Andre Turner being added that Faraji and Andre were kind of a, it's like the similar play, right? The local Memphis guy that has ties to the city. And anyway, um, are you, what's your con- concern level with this uh, letter of allegations and what potentially can come of it? Ed, Ed I'll adamant. say this Ed on Friday was very adamant that he expect a lot of people, no lie, are saying, thought that this was the beginning of the end for Penny. I mean, I think even Gary had written an article basically stating that Parrish with CBS Sports. Sure. But Ed was was pretty adamant in backing Penny and, and very confident that he would he's the basketball coach. He will continue to be that moving forward. Yeah, I mean, I, I, the NCAA is notorious for doing things very slowly. Right. I mean, how long did it take him to get that James Wiseman thing figured out? And yeah. like before he was even on college campus, right? That's stuff that was from years and years ago, but it felt like it took him two years to get that figured out. So, and well, and then you didn't even opinion, get a resolution from the IARP for years after that, right? And that exactly. was supposed to be pushed through there to speed the process up. Exactly. Um, you basically broke so, the pro- process. Yeah, that's no more thing about that way. No, I don't. It's I don't think we'll there. see anything of this. For a decent period of time. I mean, maybe they may expedite something in some way just because it kind of feels like it's been small infraction after small infraction. Then you have something like this pop up. Maybe there's some type of exped- expedited process. I, I mean, I don't know what it would be, right? They already tried that and it failed. So, yeah, I don't know. I don't think we'll see anything from this within this season. Yeah, I don't for sure. It's going to be something I mean, I think that's like next season. What gives you hope, right? Is the NCAA's mm-hmm. losing power day by day? They're getting smoked in court repeatedly. Yeah, it's an anonymous letter with. I mean, I don't know. I haven't. I don't know what kind of proof there is, but like, you can't even validate anything that this anonymous person has written in there, right? Anybody they ask, yeah. oh, I mean, where's the proof of anything that's happened? Um, and they've also tried to take the approach of just being hammered recently, of like all of the people that are involved in that are no longer with the program with the exception of obviously Penny being the head coach during these times, but like the athletes mentioned and they've tried to, I think take the approach of not punishing current student athletes for things that happened in years prior to them showing up. So as far as like postseason yeah. bands or that kind of thing, like I just don't, I don't see anything happening. I think the only major concern would be the fact that you're currently on probation, right? And of the things that were listed in that letter, the academic scandal, which we've kind of been privy to since February, late February, early March, is the only one out of that entire letter that has happened since that probation was kind of initiated. So if anything is found there, and I feel like if the NCAA has any ground to stand on as far as like imposing their authority, it's around the academic side of things. Potentially. So... I think that would be the one to keep an eye on. I mean, they've been looking into that for months, I feel like, and we've heard nothing yet. We still don't know what, I mean, even, even the, uh, the letter didn't, what it it said that the academic advisor and her sister, it was also worded in a way that it made it sound like Malcolm and those guys were getting paid to let the academic advisor and her sister do their homework. Like, Hey, we'll pay you to look, to do your homework. Like, yeah, I would have signed up for that too. You kidding me? Yeah, right. You're going to vend me 20 bucks to write my paper. So anyway, I mean, and it's, I don't think it impacts this season for sure. And then we'll just have to, you know, we still don't, like I said earlier, there still has not been an official notice of allegations from the NCAA. So at this point, I don't think anything's coming of it. It definitely seemed like this upcoming season was going to be like too good to be true for it to be like smooth sailing. You get in this great class, guys that play hand in hand perfectly together. You've got shooter after shooter after shooter, guys that you know have a relatively defined role. 
and then so the, I don't want to say the wheels fall off. Like everybody's I don't, I don't everybody's been fair. on campus. Exactly. Everyone gets here early. We're not trying to add guys late. So then Penny's like, this feels sure. weird. I got to shake things up. Let's let four staff members <laughs> go. It's September. We're always having some kind of movement in September. We got to fix it up. Um. All right. Before we take a break, come back and get into the football side of things. The last thing, TJ, John Rothstein had a Q&A with Penny that mm-hmm. he put out this weekend. And it was... Uh, oh interesting to say the least i would say um penny's tone in the way that i read it was next level in a sense um what did you what did you make of of what penny had to say in this article i mean there's just a a couple of things and i wish i remembered them verbatim or knew that you're going to ask about it or i would have pulled them out but there were a couple of things where it's like it seemed like Penny couldn't get out of his own way in some of his answers. Like he's basically like, I had no clue what I was doing. I'm just making it up as I go. It's more or less kind of what he said. Yeah. Think, what was, what was the quote? He said, Rossine asked him, what was the biggest thing you've learned about Memphis being Memphis's head coach that you didn't know prior to taking the job. And the, <laughs> he's basically saying like he knew everything. He knew it was going to be under a microscope that he's a target. He he says he's his harshest critic. He knows a lot about basketball, obviously, from being in the NBA. He tried to build that pro- this program like that because he wanted to get guys there. So he tried to build an NBA staff. But it's the last line of his answer. And he says, what I didn't know was the college game, but I learned it on the fly. Which, I mean, that makes sense. He hadn't been a part of a college staff. And that was sure a lot of what people... I think kind of turn, turn their nose down initially at him getting the job was like he didn't. And he mentions that in his interviews, like he didn't pay his dues. Yeah. Um, to kind of get to the point where he's at. But I think that was the the line that you were pointing out of yeah. him basically saying like he didn't know what he was doing at the collegiate level. He's just going flying by the seat of his pants. And uh, there was something else in there about it. Um, it was something about having momentum, like, hey, we were winning. We were ranked in you know, the top 10 in the country. Um, why don't I have momentum right now? And it's like, okay, well, you're forgetting the other half of that season where shit hit the fan and you had injuries. You were dropping games. You had no business losing. You didn't make the tournament. I mean, I think we're at a point now where it's, uh, is it five years now? Uh, six. This is being going to be year six, right? Yeah. Yeah. So five completed years. We've got three top classes, something like that. Somewhere in the top group. I don't remember the two, exact two number like ones for sure. I yeah. Think. And you've got two tournament appearances in that time. So it's like, how do you define momentum? We don't have a single conference tournament championship or excuse me we don't have a single conference championship regular season yeah yes we have the conference tournament which is great which is great but there's a, there's a big uh what if they had beaten fau in the, in the tournament right could they have been fau oh and year? that's what's so yeah that's what's so funny about it i think if two seasons go you'd made it to the sweet 16 elite eight i've I think the entire vibe around everything's probably totally different. Yeah. I think at the end of the day, people just want to see success. And I don't, outside of winning the conference tournament, that was awesome. Right. Yeah. I think playing Gonzaga close felt like we were making our way back, but it's like, you literally kind of still don't have anything to show for it. NIT championship. Cool. It was fun while we made the run. We got to keep playing basketball, but then like, Part of that excitement was thinking, hey, this team is young and they can all come back and next year we will be really good. And then that team was blown the F up. So then it's just like you're starting up back over at ground one. So I think, yeah, if he had had a, if we'd beaten FAU, we'd mm-hmm. made a run, obviously to Sweet 16, Elite Eight, even further. Like, I don't think that it's the same discussion today, which is fair. Like, I think that that's fair. Yeah. I mean, um, I think it can call- all comes down to how you define success, right? Like yeah. the one thing that everyone points out is look at P- 
Penny's first five years of being a head coach, like he has more wins than any other coach in their first five years. And like, yes, that's true. But like, is just regular season wins enough? Like, are people just satisfied with being second and third in the conference? Yeah. So at some point, you've got to give me something more. And I understand he's he does have the recruiting classes. That's great. You didn't show anything with those recruiting classes. Nothing came of those. Yeah. But, I mean, look, if he has a good year this year, I'm not calling for his head. If he has a good year next year, I'm not calling for his head. But at a certain point, you, you have to show me something, right? Like we, we're we flirting with the tournament. We are hanging on for dear life in the conference tournament to even get an invite. You don't have yeah. Houston. Cincinnati is, is dead and gone. They haven't been themselves in years. So it's like, what what's the deal? Like why why can't we get back to this level of dominance? Yeah. Just I mean, I, I will me. say I, I think and you just talked about it. I think his point around look this is and that I have to remind myself that also that this has been his first five years. Like we already said, he has not been a part of a college program. It's not like he mm -hmm. was a lead assistant anywhere and got to spend time watching how a program's run or doing a being a part of a successful program in that way. Like this is legitimately not only his first five years as a head coach in college, but his first five years coaching college period at any capacity or being a part of a college program. So to me, I'm like, yes, okay, you've in that sense and learning on the fly, I would say that you've, yeah. you've done fairly well. But what and him talking about comparing his first five, six years to other guys' first five, six years, I mean, the other half of that is like, well, have those other guys had the resources and things that you have had in their first five or six years? Did they have two number one recruiting classes? Were they exactly. getting the top transfer in the portal year after year? Did they have these huge notable former head coach lead assistants on their staff? And that like, did they have one of the top budgets in all of the country, like to basically give them whatever they needed to be successful? Sure. I don't think so. It so, is a, a kind of an interesting place to be in for Memphis basketball, right? Like yeah. it is a large budget. Um, I know you and Kenny are going to fist fight me on this. I still think we're a mid-major. You're on the upper echelon of the mid-major, but you are a mid-major. <laughs> I think you, you define the norm there, but I think they still fit into the category of mid-major. You're set up for so much success here because even if you went with local talent, you're still going to be a pretty damn good team. Right, you don't you don't have yeah. to go out and get these these national uh, guys from Chicago or DMV or Atlanta, wherever they may be. Like you don't have to do that. Like technically, you could probably stay in, in the tri-state area and put together a pretty damn good team. But that's not what he's done. It's and it's I guess that's how a lot of people are doing these days. But did you just say go um, get guys from the DMV? Yeah. Where's what does that mean? DMV. DC, Maryland, Virginia. Oh, DMV. Even like the DMV, like where you go get your driver's license. <laughs> no, nah, man. Like uh, the DC, the Washington, oh. DC, Maryland, Virginia, gotcha. where they all okay. touch tips, you know, like touch tips. Yeah. Here. Docking. Oh, mm, what? I don't know about that. I don't think there's a port there. Oh, but I don't know. It just seems like if your goal is to win as many regular season games, like yeah, he's he's done very good at that. But I don't I don't know that that keeps you safe at many places. Yeah, I mean I don't. It, it's I think it's also because the things that I feel like have been holding him back have been very fixable, right? Mm -hmm. And he's also obviously shown the ability to come out and compete at the highest level. We're talking sure. about hand in Tennessee their first home loss and I don't even remember what it was they had like a 50 game winning streak at home or something same thing with Houston you went down to a Houston top 10 team and beat them on the road for the first time in 35 whatever however many games it was like yeah he has big games but then it's just which I know happens to teams teams lose to inferior teams all the time but it feels like with this our teams, though, it happens more frequently than it needs to probably happen. Yeah. And just with the uh, like the rotations, not it feels like roles not being defined, different things like that, I think are all very fixable. Sure. Um, 
So I think that's also what the frustration kind of lies. Um, but we'll see as this staff hopefully gets mm-hmm. finalized. We mentioned Nolan Smith, uh, I think, coming on. So we're like two months away. Hopefully yeah. basketball gets uh, gets settled in and we don't hear nothing from the NCAA. Fingers crossed on we'll that. Keep, we'll keep our fingers crossed. All right, Timothy. Um, I'm going to go throw up the amount of <laughs> this pineapple jalapeno beer that I've had so far. And when we come back from the break, we got a big congratulations to give to TJ and then we're jumping into football. We'll be right back. I think it's a very small percentage of what really feels a way about Kalen Clark. And I think 90% of the vitriol that you see is towards what crazy ass fans, bro. And the people are not just her fans, but people that are using her as some type of weird ass weapon for racism. There are thousands and thousands of weird ass yahoos on uh social media who are stopping for this young lady and it makes it makes it hard to cheer for her man i'm a dude who loves basketball me personally her fans are so fucking weird like i just i can't deal with them and but see what the difference between me and cheryl swoops is she gets paid a lot of money to cover the WNBA. she's got to find a way to not let that kind of stuff bother her and just cover the game Cover what you're seeing. It's undeniable how big Kaylin Clark is for the WNBA. Tune in to the Anthony Sane Show Wednesdays and Fridays at 12 p.m. weekly on the Bluff City Media YouTube channel. This is like getting down early in the basketball game. At least you got down early. You got an entire game to get back into it. This is, it happens early enough that he can get himself back and into the flow of things and still be a, a, a really huge contributor for this team. You know, in the grand scheme of things, I guess good news also is, I mean, this is this is a guy that, you know, he's coming off your bench. You, you, yeah. you just lost a guy that's coming off your bench. Um, it's unfortunate because you, I, I was excited to see what he'd be in this role. He was, he was huge because he, he, he was, he was different than anybody that we have on the team. Yeah. Even at, d- despite what his age is, just with the, his skill mixed with his size, mixed with the length, mix, mixed with the athleticism, he was he was the player that this team needed. What he does for this team is different than, than anyone else. Tune in to the Night Court Podcast with your hosts, Rob Fisher and Brevin Knight on the Bluff City Media YouTube channel. Dirty, 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 dirty. My Kenny, mouth is dirty. Welcome to the show. Somebody match my nasty. I've been okay. a nasty girl. That is my biggest complaint of this football season so far. Is, is that it's song it's being played? I hate that song. Why? Somebody match my nasty. Somebody match my nasty. Well, I'll tell you who was a nasty girl this weekend. That's T- TFT. Mr. 1750. I'm a nasty girl, nasty, up in 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 a nasty girl, nasty, Somebody but DJ's nasty. Somebody gonna match my breed. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we've mentioned it multiple times throughout the history of this podcast. TJ and I are a part of a weekly pick 'em where we pick only one game, only the University of Memphis Tigers game. Put in two dollars every week. Pot rolls over. Somebody's got to pick the score exactly. The last time the pot was won was the 2019 season against Houston. Hasn't been won since. Good season. omen. Ladies and gentlemen, TJ, our very own, did it for the podcast. Let's go. Won this weekend and got almost $1,800 out of it. 
38 to 17. Y'all heard it here first. TJ picked it on Monday night, submitted his score in our group chat. I think that night or Tuesday morning, mm. first score submitted, and it was the right score. You, I wish all of you could have seen how nervous he was for the last three minutes of that football game. I didn't watch it. I'm not going to lie. The entire last couple of drives, I was like, I'm not watching because we have seen this happen. Oh, we time have and seen time again. a fumble. In a, a scoop and score ruined somebody. Last We've seen game. a field goal off the off the uprights ruin the score. A PAT off the uprights. Uh, it was a score. PAT. Excuse me. Yes. At one We've point seen off. random safeties. We've seen us go for two for absolutely no reason whatsoever. All sorts of bad beats. And TJ Tom, finally I was did like the was thirty-eight like seventeen, which tight. was a score that I wanted as well. I think I even said that when he picked it last week that he took it right out of my mouth. Yes. So, anyways, congratulations to our very own uh, TJ from Twitter for finally winning the pot after almost five years of no Thank winners. You. It's amazing. What an amazing accomplishment. I'm so happy for it you, man. Went, went straight to diapers. Yes. It actually, part of it did go to diapers. Of course it did. I gave TJ the check today. He went straight to Costco. Yep. Um, all right. Well, with that, the 3817 TJ, our TIGs busted them Trojans just like they needed to. Just like they needed to. I mean, that's the game we were looking for. Not only that, we have a free we have a freaking running game. <laughs> to say the least. You kidding me right now? The concern coming out of UNA was well, this this offensive line. We can't run the ball. We had fifty seven rushing yards. TJ, let me tell you something. I think what two and a half yards per carry last week. Yep. Seven and a half yards per carry this week. You ran Baller. for two hundred and eleven yards <clears throat> as a ball club. Both Mario Anderson and Greg DeWozier averaged seven point four yards a carry. Mario was 17 rushes, 125 yards, two tutties, a long of 26. Greg DeRosier with eight, 59 yards, long of 28. Seth even got in on the action, two rushes for 24 yards, a long of 20. BT had two rushes and two tutties for three yards. I mean, goal line absolute specialist. You're not stopping him yeah. from getting to the end zone. No. Prayers up to that one safety that. that tried to run up and stop BT from full yeah, speed plowing into the end zone. Never a bad it. idea. Uh, how fired up are you about this rushing attack now? I mean, it's nice to see that it's it's working. I mean, I think there were some gen- some legitimate concerns after the first game because you're like, you know, all things considered, you you should be able to kind of overpower you and they it doesn't matter if you prepared for yeah. a four man front and they're giving you a three man front. I just think the general um talent that you have should probably overpower kind of what well, they had. Especially given the week before they gave up two hundred and exactly twenty five yards or whatever it was to SEMO, right? Like you would have yeah. I'm not saying go out there and run for two fifty or anything, but like can we at least get hundred and twenty five rushing yards? Sure. I just it I think it just was a yeah. prime and example it, you know, of game plans. In the interview today, Ryan said that they're not <laughs> what's going on. TJ you, TJ got TJ won seventeen hundred dollars this week and now he just is like the man, can't say nothing in front of you, he talks over you. Oh, how is you? How is you? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not, oh, I'm I'm not, who was it trey you're an unbiased observer I'm, who was it uh, my and kenny had started speaking first and tj was like he, he wasn't even here <laughs> I, I didn't hear that i just heard game plan and i was like <laughs> yeah he'd been talking for a good six or seven seconds all right go ahead well i i was just gonna say and i'll make it quick it just is a i think it's a prime example and hear me game. out like let me <laughs> I deserve that. I deserve that. That's that is well played. Well played. It's just game planning, right? Like that you you have a it was very clear in that first 
uh, drive with Sutton Smith in that in the UNA game. They were targeting him, putting him in different positions, trying yeah. to get him solidified. As soon as he leaves the game, that kind of went out the window, and and it, it does feel like that they had a conversation with Mario. Is like you're the man now. Like you've always been the man, and you're going to now be the man all the time. And now he's got a real shot at breaking D'Angelo's record. I mean, he's gonna have to put up more than 125 a week, but he's gonna get the touches. Maybe not really. He's probably not rushing 30 times a game. No, no. ever. Um, no, I, I know Ryan said that they, and I think it's maybe semantics and kind of how the question was worded. Yeah. Question or statement, however you want to look at that, <laughs> that they were holding back their playbook. It, it seemed like maybe they just didn't, they only flipped it through a couple of pages. They didn't go through all 200 pages of the playbook, right? A lot yeah. of it seemed like inside zone, inside zone, outside zone, outside zone, RPO with inside zone. Like, you know, it was one thing after another. Um, it wasn't like they were really doing anything. You didn't see many shots downfield unless it was an obvious cover zero situation. You had uh, clear, obvious one-on-one scenarios. Like, if you have that, they're going to take that. I, I've, and I think we've seen that in every game so far. And this even goes last goes back to last season. If you right. got Rock in one on one, you got Demir in one on one. They're going to take that. They're going to take those shots as you should, right? I mean, I, I think if it, anytime it's one on one and you have faith in your guy and you can put the ball there if you're Seth, you take that shot, right? So it, it kind of makes sense. But I thought it was an interesting response from from Ryan to say that they haven't truly opened the playbook. But I mean, let's be frank, they haven't opened the playbook, and and I would sure. say. I would say, Trey, you, you kind of brought up a good point earlier. You said the perfect answer would have been, we've had 61 plays each game that we've played. Like, yes, of course, we haven't played every single um, – we haven't had every single play in our playbook. we got a big playbook. Like, we haven't yeah. opened it all the way up. But again, and Ryan brought up a great point. How many pass interferences did Rock get in that game? Right? How many, yeah, like, how many were called and how many were not actually called? Yeah. So, so I think that yeah. also played a – one a part of not taking shots down the field was the wind impact, right? And very early on, you saw very Seth clearly, was, very clearly. It yeah. was it was one way or the other. It was impacting because Seth was off target. I mean, either sailing or underthrown, um, which is a concern a little bit. And we, we can get to that in a second. But I think that also obviously played a role. And then, yeah, the I mean, just the pass interferences and everything that was going on. Yeah. But yeah, no. one thing I think I'm so tired of you already. I'm so tired of you. Go ahead, Kenneth. Go ahead. Go ahead, Kenneth. Go ahead, Go ahead TJ. Go ahead. This is why I hate StreamYard so much. I hate it so uh, much. The one thing that was that was a nice takeaway from that game, I think that you saw consistency from the defense which is the one thing I think we all wanted is, you know, the UNA game happened. You're like, great. We played UNA. They're not. Yeah. You know, are we just good respect, or not? They're not really yeah. exactly. They're not like, you know, they're not necessarily on your level. They're not even relatively near your level. So your defense should have looked like that. Let's play Troy yeah. who has owned the Sun Belt for years on years on years. Even if the offensive coordinator is gone, the head coach is gone. The defensive coordinator is gone. You bring in Jared Parker, He's been at OC at, at big stops before. Like he understands offense. He's been around for a while. Um, it should have been an easy transition, right? And we look great. The defense looked very good, I thought. I, I don't think anyone could really complain too much about how the defense looked. Yeah, I think the defense is, has looked very good. Over what? This is two games. I mean, we were in a similar situation last year as well between playing Bethune and then Arkansas State. But um, I saw people out there, what are we – Total defense over on the nation, 17th right now. 17th, I think. Yeah. Um, but I didn't feel like Troy was able to really do anything very well. I mean, some of that may also be because after their initial scoring drive, Goose, Goose Crowder didn't play anymore. He got hurt on that yeah, hit right there hurt. at the goal line where I think it was Davion Ross lit him up right mm -hmm. at the goal line. Um, so maybe some of it's that and bringing in uh, Caldwell, their backup. But, you know, they got. They got their running back in the second half. He didn't really – I mean, he had seven attempts for 33 yards, not 
great. Not really. I mean, Green, mm-hmm. the other running back, had 10 attempts for 20 yards. Um, I mean, they did have 101 yards rushing through seven different guys carrying the ball, but 150 through the air. They just, I don't feel like they ever really looked like the game was never in doubt ever. No, never. Like no. even when Troy tied it seven, seven, <laughs> we immediately basically went down and took the lead back. And then we're up 21, seven yeah. and a half. You uh, guys have been, you guys have been following Memphis football for years and years and years. I want to ask you guys a question. Is this so far with what you've seen? Is this defense has it been because they've played against teams that maybe aren't as talented, or are they legitimately good? I think they're legitimately good. I, I'm honestly in years past we've played teams like Troy that have still put up. I you know I think about good numbers, right? What was that? 2018 when we played South Alabama here and they weren't there. I mean, at that point in time, they were still like a bottom half of. I don't know what they were in at that. Were they in the Sun Belt then? I don't know what they Sun were. Belt, yeah. Or Conf- um, but we won that game like 59 38 or something like they still put up. It just felt like yeah. while we were in control and we were up like two scores the whole game, they just never would go away. You know what I mean? Like. We've played most because we kept leaving as that white receiver and that other receiver wide open. But. Yeah. Um, but I just I feel like we've had similar games with teams like this before. ULM in 2019 when we went down there, I felt like it was the same style that we won like 55 34 or something. Um, you know, we have these games where we've we've had to put up 50 points, the other team still scores 30 plus. I mean, it ends up being a three score game, but they were still able to move the ball. And and kind of get what they wanted at times, and it just that did not happen on Saturday at all. I mean, I felt like we continued to get off the field. We were making plays left and right. Like the defense, they just have a different feel for me this year. I think it's the speed at which they're playing and just how they attack the Mm -hmm. football. And I don't feel like I think that initial drive. I was in the car driving um, on the way there. Was a little late on on Saturday. Got there about midway through the first. I think outside of the first drive, we haven't seen like tackling issues and stuff that we've seen previous years either. I feel like the first guy that's getting there is usually like the ball carrier is down, right? Whereas years past, it's like it's we should have had a tackle a for a loss. And it, yeah. Right. It's should have been a tackle for a loss. It ends up being a five or six yard gain because it's the third or fourth guy that actually makes the tackle as opposed to the first guy that gets there. And I don't feel yeah. like that's happening. Anymore. It feels as like it, they're just more fundamentally sound on the defensive side of the football. And they're playing. I think it goes back to what we talked about. Was that last week, TJ? And like what Chandler Martin and others have said is it's exactly what Hankins has point. simplified it, but not in a sense to where it makes them any less effective on the football field. It's actually enabling them to play faster and be mm-hmm. more reactive in playing. Describe that. Think, what what does that mean? See that. What does I mean, that mean? You know, when you think too much, at times yeah. that can be almost. It slows you down. Right? It's yeah, paralysis by analysis in a sense. But on the football field, right? Like you start overthinking instead of just being a natural. I mean, these guys have played football their whole lives, right? They know how to make plays. Yeah. You just have to be able to put them in positions to make those plays, not make them think about how they get into those positions to make those plays. I know we weren't, I know we're not a part of Jordan Hankins's defensive, you know, meetings and things like that, but what do you think the message is? What do you, or what do you think the game plan is that he's put in place that has simplified it? Like uh, you're, you're talking about making decisions. They're just there. What does that mean? Like, how do they, how did they practice that? What was it said? Like, what was it? what, What did he do to make that happen? I mean, my guess is he's probably, Sticking more to a just a base defense, I think for one, gotcha. you know you're not changing up. They will change up their formations. We've seen that already. We've seen guys swip in and swap in and out nonstop. Um, but I think it's running a, a lot of it out of the same shell. It's, um, you know, not having to read multiple guys at once, right? Just kind of see football, watch football type of situation. It, it's not if you're a linebacker, it's not, hey, I need to worry about this running back and that wide receiver over there. Depending on what that receiver does, I'm either going to have to follow him out and then leaving someone else to kind of 
ro- like kind of roll over and take over the running back and watch him there. Uh, it's just, it, I think they're taking away a lot of the double thought processes and just trying to make everything quick and reactive. And it's showing up on film that way, right? I, any, any game we watch, Trey has pointed it out. They're playing faster. You have multiple hats getting to the ball. It's game tackling, like you said. It's not just one guy getting there. It's two guys, three guys, four guys, because they all have, here's my one read, find the ball. And it's very fast, very effective. And I think that comes back to Hankins. Um, not Nothing against uh, previous defensive coordinators, but I think this comes back to Hankins being a better teacher hmm. and, and, and saying things like, um, tell me why you did that. And then a, let me correct it. You know, I can't make you get there faster, but I can kind of change the angle. I think that's the way he has worded it. Like I can show you how to get to that faster as opposed to making you faster to get there. So interesting. um, Yeah. It's, it's little things like that, that I think they have come into play. Into the teaching aspect. I know, I think we've talked about this on a previous episode, but Hankins has talked about that and his approach to doing that. Right. He wants to make sure that the guys understand why they are doing what they're doing Mm. it's not just hey i'm telling you to do this go do it i i need you to understand and let me know that you understand why we're doing what we're doing because if you get to that point then that's also why you can sort of play without thinking about it Mm. right like when you have a full grasp and concept of what you're trying to do like you can go out there and just do it it becomes almost second nature in a sense i feel like you you guys mentioned this a few weeks ago, and I think these games are kind of playing out in this way. It almost feels like to me that his defense is most effective when he can put a lot of pressure and and accountability on his linebackers. Because he is he's got those linebackers doing a lot out there on defense sure. and they can handle it because Elijah Herring and Chandler Martin and Matt, whatever I forgot his last name. What's That's his last Hudson. name? Matt Hudson. Like these guys are guys that can handle the the pressure that Jordan Hankins' defense puts on them. Right. Yeah. Like that's what it feels like. It, 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 and as as a former linebackers coach, it kind of makes sense, right? That yeah. his defense works well when his linebackers are. Well, and I mean, really he's good. still he's still primarily in charge of the, like that's his position group still right like he's yeah. still coaching yeah. the linebackers positionally um talking think- about that makes makes me very sort of fomo i guess it's not fear of missing out because we are missing out but having javante Mackey back there with oh, also, God. and just have, like seeing him included in that group this year i just that have been special i mean obviously we get to hopefully see it next year but sure um we don't get to see it with Elijah Herring, right? Because Elijah's right. done after yeah. this year. So, yeah. And shout out to a Eli- freaking uh, AAC Defensive Player of the Week this week. Yeah, I think okay. Mario was was on a roll. He is a monster, like in person. Did you see the? Did y'all see the post game press conference that he did? Like, he is a much bigger individual than I thought he was. Like Chandler walks in the room and you're like, okay, you're an athlete. Like I can tell. Yeah. But he does. He's not a physically imposing person. Elijah walked in. I was sure. like, "Oh, damn! <laughs> yeah, he's a big yeah. dude." Yeah, eight tackles, six solo, a sack, two TFLs, a forced fumble, a fumble recovery because he just snatched that thing, one armed it, and s- recovered it himself. Heck of a game out of Elijah. Yeah, big time. Kenny, wh- why are you kicking Elijah off the team? What did I do? Is he only kicking him off the team? Yeah, he's class of twenty two. Ooh, you made me question myself for a second there. I thought he was a. I thought he was a grad transfer. My bad. He's only a junior. I'll keep. Hey, he's class of twenty twenty two, baby. So next year we could see Chandler, Elijah, and Javante with a little Matt Hudson take him down. He. I think he's he's gone. gone, Actually, oh, he's gone. Okay, Okay. yeah, he's gone. Yeah. <laughs> okay, never mind. No, kick Matt out. Kick Matt off the team. We'll get Javante. Yeah, no, I'm sorry, Matt. I'm joking. We uh, we talked. <laughs> we know he's listening. We know he's listening. <laughs> you talk about how good the linebackers have been playing, but part of that comes from, and it kind of sounds crazy to say because there hasn't been much um, 
defensive line production, I guess is maybe the way I should word that, but there's not, there's, there hasn't been a lot of pressure on the quarterback from the defensive line specifically, but the only way the linebackers are able to play so freely is because the defensive line is doing such a good job at taking on the offensive line and keeping the offensive line off of the linebackers, giving them room yeah. to move, room to make these plays and kind of fly around. So it, it's interesting how it's um, something we we typically, and we're all guilty of it, right? We, we've been sitting here talking about it, like, you know, how great the, the, the linebackers have been, but we don't mention the defensive linemen. Which makes sense, right? Because they're not making the tackles, so they're kind of the unsung hero here. But uh, they can't, you know, linebackers can't really get it done without the linemen taking on the guys. So, well, I will say this: Patrick Lucas Jr. was He's a big boy. He's been doing. Whew, good. He had a really good game against Troy. He was everywhere. Yeah. He can move, which is so much for three hundred and twenty pounds or whatever. <laughs> he is so big, and he can move like he was doing. He was making a lot of plays, and I don't know the language for it, but away, like down the line, like when they would try to spread a, a running back out, like he he was making plays in the flats, not just stuff in the run in the middle. Like I was, I was yeah. super impressed by Patrick Lucas. Yeah, he's played very well, uh, especially this last game. I think more so than yes. previous games. I think it's showing up on the on the tapes a little bit more. Trey and I talked about it. Um, I think yeah, it was at the game specifically. But another name, uh, a new name to the defense, AJ Watts has been very good for this team. Very good. Uh, we yes. were, and it, it shows up on you know in the statistics if you look at him at his previous stop. I mean, he was good there, but like. He's been a good addition. He moves around. He's flying all over the place, and I think that's going to help out a lot because uh, he seems like he is going to be a pretty vital part of that secondary next to Ross and Miner. Um, could be Coffee. It could be whomever at that other position. Trey uh, Greer could be also be back there. They seem to move those guys around a bit. Have y'all been pretty impressed with the secondary? I mean, y'all, the secondary has been – very good, I think, so far this year, which was yeah. which was coming into the season was the thought might be the weak spot for this team, right? For this defense. I mean, it has been for several years. I, I think through two weeks, they are greatly improved from what we've seen. I mean, I like Ross and, and Kobe on the corners yeah. a lot. And we, I mean, TJ just mentioned AJ Watts. Like, yeah. I mean, we'll see in the coming weeks. I don't know that. I'm too worried about DJU and then Navy. Obviously, we might have the best pass defense in the country after the first month of the season. But uh, I think we're sitting top 30 right now. We're only giving up 130, 130. yards through the air. Yeah, that's like that. 134 through the air. Yeah. So far. Hey, granted, how much of that is circumstances? You know, you had sure UNA the first game. The second yeah. game, the starting quarterback gets hurt, so it's the backup coming in. Is he well equipped? Yeah. No one was really throwing the ball around in that Memphis yeah. Troy game because of the win. I mean, that win was strong. Yeah, it was. Uh, I think we saw it come into effect on a couple of plays. Um, so I, I get why we didn't see some some big passes left and right all over the place in that game. Yeah. Um, two things before we move uh, into the Silverfield Norbell Bowl, but I will say, of concern, if there was any, just to to find something out of Saturday's game one penalties. Hmm. I mean, historically the last several years, we've been one of the least penalized teams in the country. Mm -hmm. Saturday we had, I think seven penalties for 70 yards. Uh, I mean, it was a heavily penalized game. There were, it was a dirty, it was a dirty game. It was a dirty game. Sure. Um, I mean, I think there probably could have been 30 pass interference calls if, if yeah. they wanted to call all of them. And then the second, I mean, we've talked about it. I think the win played part of it. I'm glad that the running game was there. We we still put up 38. We won by three scores. But I'm just going to be honest. Like, I think Seth was very underwhelming. And I, I don't know that you're going to win every week with – um that kind of stat line out of Seth, if that makes sense. You won't 20 win. 32. You won't win every week. For no. one, 160 and a one touchdown. Yeah. 
I mean, that's not terrible from completion standpoint, but just from a yardage and, and t- touchdowns perspective, like I feel like you just you need more out of him. I feel like that's where I feel like when Ryan when when Ryan was asked the question today about his playbook, I think if, if you were to ask that question and say specifically in the passing game, what can we expect you to your your offense to do more of? I think there's a lot more that they're going to pull out possibly in this game against Florida State this week, right? Where yeah. there's just not been a whole lot of creativity creativity to the passing game so far. And I think that's where, I mean, you see most of Rock's completions have been, you know, three-yard or five-yard digs. You know what I'm saying? Like, just not really. Yeah, sure. I, I mean, so from a plays perspective, big plays, which would be like 20-plus yards, I think statistically is how it's kept. We had two big passing plays on Saturday, mm-hmm. which is 20 or more yards. But uh, again, there were several pass interferences where Seth sure. threw up the rock and his sure. arm is being held down to the point where he couldn't yeah. even lift it. It was right in front of us. They didn't call it. It was kind of bananas. No, uh, I mean, uh, yeah, uh, for sure. Um, and honestly, I think sorry, we, we've just come become off. accustomed to, to Seth slinging the thing and multiple tutties and 300 yards. I'm not saying he's got to do that every week. I'm just saying down the road, I think you're going to need more out of out of Seth to continue to win ball games. And, but maybe but I'm wrong. Maybe the defense is very, very good, and we can just ground and pound, and Seth just can do what he's got to do to. That way, I don't know. Do you think they've had to make big passes? No, big plays down the field so far, though. No, I don't think it's been needed. So that's why it's not terribly yeah. concerning. And I just feel like I'm nitpicking just to sure. say, You're hey, gonna have to. if there was anything, this was what it was. Yeah, it, it, it does run counter to. Tiger offenses of years past under Cramsey with Seth, where it's right. aired out, air it out. Almost honestly, it's kind of felt like they've they've thrown it to open the run because you start backing everyone up to yep. account for yeah. the pass and then the run. Yeah. The, the first possession of the underneath. game. The first possession of the game against Troy. Seth came out and threw five straight passes, and then they yep. started handing the ball off to Mario. You know, like yeah. it was very clear they were trying to use the pass to open up Mario's run lanes, you know. So yeah. sure. Yeah. All right. It's also um, go. It's time. No, I was gonna say it, it's also uh important to note that Seth's smart and anytime it's an RPO, he's more than likely gonna play the numbers and not try to force a pass and he's gonna hand it off, hand it oh. off. So sure. I think a lot of that comes into play as well. Because there are a yeah. couple plays last game where you saw him throw it to rock and you're like, mm-hmm. like <laughs> probably not the play to make, but what are you going to do? Yeah. All right. It's here. The much anticipated, which is now kind of like a meh, feels like a bummer almost. Yeah. Um, given the fact that the fighting Norvells have been doo-doo brown so far this season they don't uh, the they don't look like a competent college football program right now they don't but i will i would I'd be lying to you if i said i wasn't a little bit worried and we'll jump into it so oh and two they've got losses to georgia tech and boston college at home who absolutely i mean manhandled them the whole game ran oh, all boston over them. college I think, I think they boston. ran for 260 yards or something um, yeah, nasty game. Which which gives me hope, given what we just saw Saturday, out of our rushing attack. And I think, I think Mario is the type of back that can be successful against that that front eight of of Florida State in the rushing game. Um, line actually opened up last week to a lot of people's surprise at one and a half, basically a pick 'em in favor of Florida State. It's now moved to I think seven and a half, maybe eight at this point. It's I mean, people have been hammering Florida <laughs> State, seven. which is what I feel like is exactly what happened in week two. Everybody hammered Florida State against Boston College because they're like, this is the bounce back game. Um so 
it's up to a tutty possession game. I just I feel like this is a it's a Florida State is in a must win scenario. Yeah. Like one, you start knowing three, you're already 0 and 2 in conference. And then just the icing on the cake is that this is Norville's former program coming into town. Like yeah. you can't you can't lose <laughs> that game. <laughs> I mean, I'm not saying that they won't lose it. I'm just saying as a Florida State fan, if I were one, which I'm not, this is a no you cannot lose this ball game. Um ESPN, it's a 11 a.m. ESPN following game day, so we're going to get some pub, which is great. Over under set at 52 and a half. Uh, it opened, according to ESPN, bet at three and a half Florida State. It's now at seven and a half. FPI gives Florida State a 72.8% chance to win. I don't know how I feel about it. I don't like the fact that they're coming off a bye. I wish we could have played yeah. them in one of the first two games. I'd feel a lot better about it. I also wish that they were they had found ways to win those two games and were two and zero, oh, because then I'd feel real good about it. Um, I just we know Mike, like he's he has spent this twelve days figuring out something that he thinks is going to work, right? Like. It makes me think, I've said this multiple times today to different people in discussions, it makes me think of the 2008 UCF conference title game, right? We had played UCF earlier in the year. We lost to him at home. We came out, we ran wildcat the whole first half. <laughs> and we were up like 17 at halftime. I feel like we're going to see a scenario where he comes out, he knows that DJ's been terrible, and he's going to something, It's he's going to have installed something that's going to require an adjustment out of us. To be able to stop i feel like i don't know if it's going to be the wildcat or what it would be but <clears throat> it just feels like that type of thing right like he's going to figure out something that's going to give them yeah a little more than what they've been getting so far. yeah gabe was talking about it on on the bluff and he was talking about what this last 12 days have been like for florida state with mike norvell as the coach obviously gabe would I'm, know because gabe played for him right he I'm said it's been disgusting he said he goes i can guarantee you every player coach everybody in that place has had their job threatened at least six times in the last 12 days like everybody has been threatened with their job in the last 12 days <laughs> I was yeah. like, it's like i bet it's been intense over there boys <laughs> yeah I, can, I can't imagine i cannot imagine um timothy give me your thoughts on the on the game i mean it, you're, it's kind of a weird spot for Memphis, right? Because it is. It's it, it's it, not it, what it, it was. It, it used to be a free shot. You lose it. It doesn't matter. <clears throat> Almost. Yeah. As long as you don't get like embarrassed. Yeah, because if you win, it's a watered down Florida State. So you'll probably get, I don't know, half half the credit you would for beating a, a team with that type of talent on the roster. You know, the last two teams that beat them got ranked immediately. You're not going to get that. Um, if you lose, well, you were, you were supposed to lose, right? And from an optics standpoint, granted, it's still early in, in the season. Uh, everyone is thinking this is a bad, a bad Florida State team. So if you are losing to a bad Florida State team, that shows that the group of five really isn't that good, actually. And maybe it, Boise is the better group of five team kind of situation. So there's some other implications that could come from a loss that, you know, Florida state just could go out and play DJ finally puts that shit together after seven weeks of football. He just, he figures it out finally. Um, you know, it, it's just a weird situation, right? Either you win and you're like, ah, cool. Kind of feels like we just played a, a talented version of Troy again. And if you lose, well, you know, you lost to a bad team. So I mean, it's, it it seems ridiculous to say, and I I don't think that this is the scenario. But it, in a sense, I just said it was a must win for Florida State. It kind of feels like a must win for Memphis. Oh, yeah. I mean, I know that it's not, <clears throat> but I don't the know. Feel, it's just the kind of turned are, into a crappy situation. The feelings around the yeah. game have changed to where it almost feels like a must win at this point, right? Especially yeah. with, especially with the way that. You see Boise playing. You see um, Tulane 
you know, I mean, shoot, even Northern Illinois just went into Northern South Illinois, just, Notre Dame. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's, uh, I, and I know Tulane and, uh, Boise lost both of those games, but they were top 10 yeah. or, you know, Oregon was a top yeah. 10 team in the country. Like it's a tough game and they ha held their own. So it's almost like, does yeah. Boise get more of a jump for how they played against Oregon? Then if, even though they lost, if Memphis yeah. goes to Florida state in Tallahassee and loses, right. do they, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like they, in their scenarios, they've almost still gained respect out of the performance they had. Where yeah. in this situation, it now feels like no matter what happens, if you come out of Tallahassee with a loss, you're we're now behind the eight ball as far as the G5 playoff spot. Sure. Right? If they like, beat Florida State, I don't think that's true. I'm, no, I, just, I don't, no, no, no. I, I'm not saying beat. I'm saying if we come out with a loss, we are okay. Okay. We're on the outside looking at We're fighting. We're trying to fight back for that spot now. Oh, absolutely. If they lose that's that what makes it yeah. that's what makes it feel must win. If you win, you're fine. Right. And I, I'll feel very good about the rest of the season. It's just taking a loss to a Florida State team that feels like they're gonna go like seven and five or six and six and finish middle yeah, the lower half of the ACC is just it's it's crazy how know. much this game has changed because at the beginning of the year it was if you win it, it skyrockets. If you lose it, it's okay. Yeah, now it feels like it's changed from if you win it, okay. If you lose it, yeah. Yeah. That's that's such yeah. a wild narrative change. It is. Just and obviously it's three weeks in, so a lot can happen. Florida State could ramble off nine straight and it would be fine sure. and end up being an okay loss. And Liberty and Boise could all lose three games and one loss to Florida State means nothing. But in the present moment, it still feels like Man, I want to go out there and beat them in Tallahassee. All-time record. Do you guys know how many times we've played Florida State? We were in the conference with them for a long time, so we played them we quite were. a few times, I'm sure. We were. 20 times. Close, Timothy. 18. Um, mm. You know what the all-time series record is? It's probably not good. Of 18? Uh, 15 and 3. Well, let's just say 12 and 5. No, is that bad math? 12 and six. Yeah, it is. Uh, TJ, not far off. Seven Memphis, seven wins, mm. Florida State, 10 wins, and one tie, fellas. That's the worst, dude. We tied. Ties. Uh, Florida State is currently on a oh, the tie. The tie was in 1984 in Memphis, 17 to 17. Florida State has won four in a row and eight of the last nine. All wow. seven of our wins, no, six of our seven wins, we had six in a row from 69 to 76. We won six straight. Largest margin of victory for us, 42 to 14. We might see that wow. again this weekend. I mean, is there anything that you've seen out of Florida State over these two games that makes you think that they can fix right. what ails them? I mean – yeah, game game plan wise, yes. Like Norvell can do some different things, right? But like they lost their running back. DJU has not been good at all, and he's never really been good in all of his time in college football, right? Like, who are their best? Who are their skill guys that are? Yeah, like it just doesn't. You don't. You can't transplant this roster, right? Like they just don't seem to have the horses this year, like they did last year. Which yeah. makes sense because a lot I of think, them. I think it's, it's all it all starts with their lines, right? Their defensive and offensive yeah. lines have not been good. And with DJ, to me, especially last year where he was respectable, but Oregon State was such a, I feel like a run first team mm -hmm. that it didn't really fall on DJ to make plays, especially like throwing the ball down the field. And they just have not yeah. been able to run the football, so it's kind of all falling on him, and he cannot throw the ball. Yeah, one ten yards down the field, like, and you know, with Norvell's offense, he has to have a quarterback that can throw those intermediate passes well. And DJ, and he's, not, he's not an that. out of pocket player either. Like, no, he just like you get you get pressure on him. He doesn't. He kind of gets happy feet, right? Like he gets scared a little bit. It looks like he gets yeah influenced by pressure a lot more so, than what by his age would. You would think. Um. 
I, I'm nervous in a sense of it feels must win. I have confidence in the fact that I just I think we are a better football team than both Georgia Tech and Boston College. Brett McMurphy puts out a weekly bowls prediction. I don't know if you guys saw this today. Um, currently, for understandably so, he's got Northern Illinois in the playoff spot, but he has Memphis projected to play Boston College in the Fenway Bowl. <laughs> and they put out lines with these hypothetical matchups. We were favored by eight over Boston College. At, in the just, Fenway Bowl. Yes, who yeah, just dominated. Them, who just dominated Florida State at home. So I'm like, yeah, we're more than a touchdown better than Boston College, and Boston College just could have won by three scores in Tallahassee. Sure. Like, I mean, they, they dominated. There's, there's no reason that we can't go down there and do that. Totally agree. The only yeah, the I only think... thing that gives me skepticism is the fact they've had a week off and Norville has had two weeks mm -hmm. to implement something. He's a creative, offensive-minded coach. He's I just I have confidence that he's going to figure out something that works for it. I will say at least a half because I'm going to give Hankins credit that he could find an adjustment and fix hopefully for it. I, I just don't. I think we the way we get ourselves in trouble is our team in a sense, coming out too hyped, right? So mm. hyped that they're making mistakes, which is what I just yeah. by hyped By hype, do you mean nervous? Not necessarily nervous, but just coming out sort of over-amped, right? Like just playing with too much emotion, which then translates to making over-pursuing or, mm -hmm. you know, trying to make a crazy play taking risk that you may not necessarily normally take kind of thing that just leads to some either a turnover or just unfortunate things yeah and then it kind of builds up and then you get in this hole that's almost too hard to kind of climb out of the rest of the time i feel like similar to that two lane game two years ago right where they we gave up a punt return and then we muffed a punt and then all of a sudden we're down like 24 to nothing in the blink of an eye and it's like they battled their ass off in the second half to come back, but it was just at that point you kind of found yourself in a hole that was too big to get out of. Yeah. I think you mentioned it already. Uh, well, I, I guess Kenny framed it in the situation of, is, is there anything that Florida State can do to um, rejuvenate their offense more or less, right? And I think, you know, Trey, you touched on it with, you know, busting out the wildcat. Like I could totally see them bringing out the wildcat. I could totally see them uh, playing both quarterbacks. I, you know, uh, Glenn can kind of run it a little bit, whereas DJU is basically a statue in the pocket. Like he's not really going to be someone who beats you with his feet. Uh, Glenn can run it though. And that's an added change to their offense that, that they haven't had all year. That's something that you haven't really had to prepare for, honestly. Maybe a little bit with you and a one of the quarterbacks did, you know, he ran it a little bit, but, um, you know, Florida state has good running backs. So the, the wildcat would work perfectly there. Um, they have a freshman running back cam Davis, who I expect to get more run against us. He's big. He was a high school quarterback. So there's your trick play. You know, Norvell is always going to throw in a trick play. Hmm. Um, so I, I could totally see them, you know, running both quarterbacks, having certain sets with both quarterbacks, bringing in cam Davis, um, kind of switching it up. Once they get their run game going, you dumb down the game for DJ. It's going to make things easier for him, and I could see him start to get in a rhythm, right? Um, now, that's going to take the Memphis defense to do something it hasn't done all year, and that would be like, you know, o like you said, over-pursuing, doing things where you're, you're talking about um, just making a lot of mental mistakes that they just haven't Miss made. Miscommunications, like, just different. Mis yeah, like stuff that they just haven't done yet. Now, it's a little bit different. You know, you've got the the chop going. You've got the war chant going. It's a different environment completely, right? Like probably one of the most badass environments in college football, let's be honest. Yeah. yeah. I think if I were in there and they are oh, I'd be like, oh, oh. <laughs> like I kind of want to do it along because it's just so badass. But um, yeah. it's just a different different world down there, man. I could totally see a situation where they've had these two weeks to prepare Norvell lit into him left and right, left and right. You dumb it down. You make the game simpler for DJ Ui. Lung, blah, 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 blah. And it, it honestly, I, I could totally see a world where they, um, you know, have some spark. 
I, I think the wildest thing about the whole Florida State offense is there seems to be a lack of speed, which blows my mind right. considering Norvell is their head coach. Like you don't have any speed. You don't have any playmakers like for an offense for playmakers. You don't have a single playmaker seemingly that we've seen yet. It's just kind of weird to me, but uh, yeah. I have I a, you, you frame this for you frame this segment. Trey is the, the Silverfield Norvell bowl. And all we've talked about a lot is Norvell and kind of what he does and the fact that there's playing against Memphis and, you know, it's his original school and all that kind of stuff. There's a motivation there. Do you think Ryan's familiarity with Norvell helps in the, the game plan for, we know he's going to do wild shit. Like we know oh, it. Yeah. A hundred percent. I think it definitely I mean, helps. Yep. I mean, you have, it, it came out today there and that's not the only coaching connection, right? It was talked about that Adam Fuller was DC right. at Marshall while Tim Cramsey was there. So there's familiarity on in that front as well. And I think these staffs know each other very well. So there's, there's certain things that they know are going to, and I'm sure. I know that, Silverfield and staff are probably thinking the same things. I'm th like, he's had two weeks. He's there's going to be something that they're going to come out with that we have not seen before to try to get some sure. sort of spark offensively. But I even in that, that sense, even in that sense, you know, Norvell has tendencies, right? Like this yeah. is his go-to when he's trying to implement new things. Like he said, oh, he 100%. even said it, he said it in the press conference today. He said, I know that he's going to watch this press conference on the way to his radio show tonight. And I also know in the second drive of the game, he's going to do a trick play. That's just what he does. I know him. I was like, oh, that's a little gamesmanship, well, man. Like, kind of yeah, that is he was he was being a little bit silly and joking around about that stuff. But you didn't feel like that was gamesmanship a little bit? Like, I know, I mean, yes, I know what you're going to do. Like, I know your flow. I know how you do things. I know yeah. everything there is to know about you. We've sat across from each other for six years. Like, I know you. And yeah. to me, it felt like it was him joking, but also a little bit of like, ain't nothing you're going to do is going to surprise me. Yeah. Right. No, 100%. Um, it should be fun, though. I'm just, as a good game, give us a chance at the end, and I'll be happy. TJ, give me your score and first Teddy pick. I don't know. I've been bouncing. Ladies and gentlemen, if you're listening, there's no way that TJ gets the correct score two weeks in a this, row. So don't it's, pick it's whatever he's about to say. physically impossible. <laughs> I am going back and forth, right? Like I could totally see Norvell having uh, 60,000 different ways of cutting us up, right? Just bringing out something new, a new look. Nonstop. With who? I, dude, it doesn't. I'm telling you that dude With is built who? differently. He's built it. Okay, think of what was it? Tulane. What game was it where we came out and just ran the damn Wildcat the entire game? It was UCF. They talked about that. It was UCF? Was game. it UCF? Yeah, yeah, UCF. Whatever it was. It was the first half of Tulane, and then we sucked nuts the rest of the game. But um, it, it's stuff like that. Like you didn't even have to have a quarterback involved in half the game. It, so it doesn't matter. Like if, if you don't, if you think DJ Madugi can't do anything against you, just Okay, make him a non-factor for a majority of the game. Simplify it, dumb it down. But at the same time, I think Cramsey is smart enough to understand that Florida State has, you know, they, they can't stop the run. They haven't been able to. They have a couple of linebackers that are out. So, you know, uh, look for Memphis to just throw the ball to running backs the entire game. Um, keep running RPOs. Make these linebackers have to get out in space and make an open tackle, which they haven't been able to do all year make them make the correct read on the RPOs. And if, and if they make that read, um, they make the correct read there, then, you know, you figure it out. You have a progression for a reason, but I think that's exactly what he's going to do is he's going to try to exploit their linebackers because they haven't been very good. And their D line hasn't been very good. I think they, they try to take advantage of those guys. So I'm looking for screens. I'm looking for making the linebackers uh, make big plays. Like I, I totally see Cramsey getting advantage over Fuller here, you know, in a, in a group chat earlier, it was either Trey or our buddy Charlie said, who has the advantage there? Like uh, both offensive coordinators, the play calling is known by someone else on the other staff. So who has the, who has the, the hands up there? Is it the OC or the DC? Yeah. 
It's a good question. I, I don't know if we know the answer. I'm guessing the offensive coordinator because they can just change the way they do things. You know, a deep, in a this, deep coordinator. In this only... particular instance, I would say it's Tim because I feel like we've got a hell of a lot of playmakers. More weapons. Got more weapons. Yeah. That they've got yeah, to try to it, defend. I don't know. It's interesting. Um, I think I'm about to talk myself say, into driving down there on Friday. <laughs> uh, I'll be with you. Well, there's like a tropical storm, so heads up on that. It'll Get already be through. Notifications on it. Um, I'm teetering back and forth, and I'm trying to decide how I play this as a fan or – because like, hear, hear me out. Like I could say Florida State 34 and Memphis 24, and I could bet that. And if Memphis wins, then I, I just paid 10 bucks, 20 bucks for the Tigers to win, and you guys are welcome. I'll pay that every game. Or if Florida State wins, then financially I win. So it's it's um it's a win-win for me there. Um I'm going to be disrespectful. I think I'm going to pick Florida State to win. But that is only because they had a week to prepare, and Memphis hasn't had that. It's going to be a hostile environment. I don't know of a, a more hostile environment that Memphis has ever gone to. Not this staff, at least. I mean, State, maybe. Depending it was, rain. it, it was raining. It wasn't that hostile. Yeah, there's still yeah. the cowbells. There's, there's, it's different. Um yeah, I'm gonna pick Florida State 34-24. Who's your first Tud? Wow. I mean Lanfear, probably. There you go. Um, I'm going opposite of you. I don't think it's gonna be that hostile. One, because they're 0 2 and they suck, so their fans are already bought out. Two, because it's at eleven AM. And that's just not if it was Tallahassee Saturday night, I'd say all right. Let those Flor Floridians get a little bit of liquored up and get in there. 11 a.m. I ain't worried about it. And their stadium's under construction. <laughs> I ain't worried. I ain't worried about no environment. Hmm. An old ass team that can handle that. And Georgia Tech, Boston College suck, and we're much better than them. And they beat the brakes off them. I think we're going to have a big Mario Anderson game. I'm going to go. I do think it's going to be lower scoring, though. I think it's going to be a faster game. Um, Memphis 27, Florida State 21. Wow. 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 Tiggs win by six. First Tuddy. I'm going Mario because he's going to have a big game. How does the game flow go? Does Memphis get up 27 to seven and Florida State scores a couple at the end? Or is it nip and tuck to the very end? Seth, they're down by one. Seth hits a wide open Rock Taylor in the end zone. I think it comes down towards the end of the game and we're down 21 20 mm. and we score late and the de defense gets gets a big stop. Mm. Okay. Wow. Our buddy Charlie just texted us that he really thinks that the, that FSU getting a bye before our game is going to kill us. Which can I, who do we need to pick a bone with that so many damn teams are getting a bye before they play us? Navy has a bye before they play team. us next week. Then USF has a bye before they play us. What's going on? They gave us our they gave us our four hardest conference games on the road and gave everybody a bye. Like, it's what the hell, AAC? Tulane has a bye, I believe. Before us? Yeah. I think so, yeah. I think so. I think Ryan said that today. I mean, that's ridiculous. Um, Meanwhile, Boise just has to play UNLV. UNLV might beat them. Oregon State, I don't know what they're going to be with their coach gone and <laughs> their quarterback gone. Am I right? Oh, my gosh. 
That's the jalapeno, huh? It was. That good. was a little bit of jalapeno like reflux there, and that was horrid. Hey, real quick, I know I want to go off topic off the Florida State game for one second, but I want to get Dude. you guys thoughts. What are, do y'all have a message for Tiger fans and their lack of willingness to attend games on Saturday? Like, does it not feel like like what is going on with the environment? Is it is it the construction? Is it what is it? Yeah, I think it's a couple of things. I mean, Jeff and Jeffrey were talking about this earlier, and I agree. I mean, COVID's played a part of it, right? Like people just. I know that we're four years removed, but four it's years still, removed away. It's Come still on. a lasting thing. People have gotten so accustomed to yeah, watching games is still at home, down. and it's it's gotten it's just easier to stay home. But also, yeah. I've said this forever: like weeknight games and earlier day games for Memphis don't work. We cannot play it. There's too much stuff going at 11 a.m. for there to be a huge crowd there. Like it's even when we play. Yeah, like that. I, w- I was late because we had soccer at 10 a.m. Like our our buddy Charlie, I don't even think he ended up making it because they had an 11:30 flag football game. Like, there's just too much stuff, and you we rely so. There's a core base of Memphis fans, right? Those bigger crowds, we rely on a casual fans to show up, and mm-hmm. if it is not some big named opponent, like just at 11 a.m., you're just not gonna get. Troy is not bringing in walk up fans, which is what we rely no. so heavily on. Like, it's just kind of, it is what it is. I think you keep winning, you are undefeated come UAB in those games. Like, there will be bigger crowds, but sure. This point in the season, there's still a lot of people that feel like I know there's a lot of hype and it feels like there's some turnaround, but there, I still know a lot of people that are still just out on Ryan and. Mm-hmm. where the program has been that they're just not totally bought back in yet. And then I think also the construction of all of it and everything plays a part of it too, right? Like, well, it makes me sad because they're missing a fun environment and they're missing. Do, yeah. It's, it has been great. The stadium, it does not feel like a construction zone. It's it very, looks amazing. It's, yes. It's yeah. great. The team has been fun to watch for me. Like I think they've been, they've looked dominant to be honest. Like, I've I've enjoyed it. So if you haven't gone out, I would highly suggest you. I would just suggest to Tiger fans, like, yes, you can come up with excuses to not come. We we know that about Tiger fans. They make yeah, we you make up excuses. You can find every excuse in the book to not come. Come to a game and just check it out. I'm not here to shill for the University of Memphis, but it has been quite disappointing i think to see so many open seats and just see a lack of of excitement around this program like this is they have the potential to be to i think they're the most talented they've been in quite a number a few number of yeah. years yeah. and it is time like i just i, I really i want to challenge memphis fans to not make excuses to not come but figure out ways to come right like yeah. like make like figure out a way to get there because you're going to love it it's a great environment. Saturday college football is the best day ever. Like, I mean, I'm a ba- I grew up being a basketball guy. You tell me I had to go cover a football game on Saturday morning. I am there wherever I can be. I love it. It is too much fun. So, yeah. 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 It's been a blast. So get out there September 28th when we play MTSU at home. We don't have a time for that game yet, but hopefully it's at night. Preferably. Um, all right, very, very quickly before we get into Fade TJ Thunder picks, FPI is updated. Last week we were third in the conference. Fellas, we've bumped up to second. Uh, thanks to USA UTSA absolutely plummeting. Dog. Down they, 35 spots. They are now they were first last week, I think, in FPI rankings in the conference. They're now ninth overall behind rice tulsa unt east carolina army uh we are 65th overall currently bumped up nine spots after that big win over uh troy we're sitting just 19 spots right now behind Tulane. that doesn't feel right <laughs> uh fpi has us going nine and three as of right now 
again, I need to know the FPI metrics. This, it's always just all over the board. It never makes any sense. We do currently have the best percentage chance in the conference to make the playoff, though, at 10.3%. All right. Which I'm not sure how that works because yeah. Tulane has the has a 41.8% chance to win the conference, so I feel like that would make their playoff chances higher, but somehow we have a better shot at making the playoffs. I don't know. FPI is weird. Yeah, that is kind of confusing. How about we cancel the ESPN FPI segment? Yeah, I don't I don't get it, but there are the efficiency ratings on ESPN overall we're 29th in the country and we're first in the American, so I'll take yeah. that. Offensively 27th and then defensively 53rd. So we'll go by the uh, efficiency rankings from now on. There you go. All right. Fade TJ. TJ finally got a victory. So sorry to those of you who may have stuck with fading him last week. He took Texas minus five and a half. Easy, easy win for TJ. Uh, your boy Thunder Picks moves to three and oh, because for whatever reason, Texas State was only three and a half point favorites over UTSA or two and a half. Absolutely. I mean, obliterated what was it 49 to 10 a majillion Just, points yes utsa is atrocious um tj give me your fade tj pick this week i don't love the board you know, this week by the way i went against michigan last week against texas but i'm gonna go back to michigan this year in their favor this week in favor of michigan Minus 24 against Arkansas State because Butch Stones oh, yeah, somehow geez. still has I'm seeing a job 20, there. I'm seeing 22, so I'll give you that. Well, I'll take 22. I had 24, so perfect. Yeah, it seems like free money. Gross. That is a good one. Um, I don't. There's just nothing on here I like a lot. Oh... I don't know. Do I take our game? That's up to you. I've spent this whole time trying to find something I want, and I don't like any of it. I almost, because UTSA is so ass, want to take Texas minus 34 and a half. But that feels like a whole hell of a it lot. It feels like you're picking on them at that point. Well, I might be. I might. I, I'll tell you. I don't want to sway you either take, way, but Washington State at Washington is only a four-point game, and that kind of confuses me. So. In favor of who? Well, I'm not following Fade TJ. I'm taking my own, and I just saw that South Florida's minus 11.5 at Southern Miss. I'm taking the Bulls because they looked nasty for three and a half quarters mm -hmm. at Alabama the other night. So South Florida yeah. minus 11.5. All right, let's get into this slow and low. And I will tell you, the name makes sense because you can't drink this shit fast. I'll give you that. <laughs> um, pineapple jalapeno. It has given me the jalapeno burps with a little bit of reflux in there. So for that, I'm deducting points. I like the can, though. We got our boy Natch yeah. in there playing the guitar. It's a good solid green. Jalapeno green. Uh, can feels like a six one. Wow. Uh, five eight. Oh my gosh, it's not dude. that good. You're all over the board right now. Uh, Trey likes the can. I don't really like the can. I mean, like, I guess the, s the slow and low looks cool because it's a jalapeno green. Um, but I'm gonna be honest with you. I don't like anything about this beer. I don't like the can. I don't like the taste. I don't like anything. Can I'm gonna say on the lower end, five four maybe. Yeah, that feels right. Be honest, how much of your sixteen ounces is still remaining? Oh, not much. A little splishy splashy at the bottom. I think I have like that. Like much. this. What is that like? I'm probably three ounces, bottom. three and a half. Mine's four. just like a hot nastiness. Maybe at the more. Bottom, maybe now. five ounces. Uh, this beer was not good. It is, I don't know what it is. It's not 
it's not terribly spicy or anything. It's just the jalapeno flavoring is it's a weird. I kept drinking it, but that, I think that's because I just wanted a beer and I don't have another one up here. I'm not going to finish it, but it's just. It's so there's a very the initial sippage is sweet. I mean, it is very pineapple. And then that. Like smoked jalapeno hits you. That's a dog. Are you getting that? I don't know what it I mean, it's. It, trying to read what it says. There, are you getting like a smokiness in here? No. Well, kind of. I feel like, like I, I don't know what it is. Took a sip of a hala, of a pineapple beer and then someone took a charcoal. Yes. A piece of charcoal and shoved like it a down. Burnt, my it's like a with like that, a burnt yes. jalapeno. Like one that was on the grill too long. Yeah. And it's not good. I don't, I don't like it. Um, I don't, I will literally never drink this again. I will never even think of, I won't even recommend anyone to drink this. If you like pineapple and jalapeno, I still wouldn't say you that you like should that. get this. No. Um, I want to find the man that recom- that created this and I will turn him over to the FBI because I think he needs to be on a specific watch list. People need to know this man's name. It says a slow burn that you can play on repeat and never gets old. I'm like, I mean, this is... After one the would first step, never be repeated and yeah i was old very quickly in a favorite summer ballard like this is it's just not i don't know what i anticipated it being but i did not think it was going to be that bad not that yeah not that like this is it's going to be a 4.2 for me it was not good. yeah i don't it's, it's not andy's score ever it's not andy's mint bad but this is like I gave it worse than Andy's mint. I did keep drinking it though, so I can't go that low. I mean, I don't know, four six. Yeah, I just what I was Andy's it. mint? What was Andy's mint? For you or me? Just both. Uh overall it was a four point five two five. You gave it a three two on the beer yeah. and i give it a four three we're gonna and have to start making that a holiday tradition we have one episode we do andy's men we have to do it every year until we force right, ourselves to enjoy it i think they stopped production on it for obvious reasons well i hope we didn't play a large part in that but i guess we'll see um all right well that's gonna wrap it up for episode 92 we went almost two hours basically Holy Toledo. It is late. We got to get out of here. You guys need to come back. Hopefully we're three and oh next week. You got a cold beer. We'll have more uh, jalapeno style takes. Peace. If you enjoyed this episode of Tigers Untapped, leave a rating and a review wherever you download your podcasts. Like and subscribe at Bluff City Media's YouTube page. Head over to www.bluffcitymedia.co for a comprehensive coverage of Memphis sports.